Hello everyone. In this video we're going to be talking about something called ATP or adenosine triphosphate as it's known as. Now ATP is what we think of when we think about a form of energy that the body is going to use. So we're going to think about exactly what ATP is, we'll talk about its structure, we'll talk about how it's formed and why it is a, in fact a good immediate source of energy and then we're going to talk about why you need ATP so what biologically this molecule is actually used for so let's start first of all with the letters and say what those letters actually mean and make a note of that so A stands for adenosine the T is tri and the P of ATP means phosphate. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Now let's look at this molecule and explain a little bit more about where those letters come from. This section here, that part there is our base and the base that this is is adenine now in um, some of my videos I've referred to nitrogenous bases A, T, C and G adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine so this is an adenine base this part here this region at the bottom that is a sugar and the sugar in ATP is a ribose sugar and then what we have here here and here are phosphate so we have phosphates here three of them phosphates are inorganic molecules so that's where the the structure kind of comes from in the name so we've got an adenine base ribose sugar and three phosphates and that gives its name ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Now, the bonds between phosphate groups that I've drawn are actually very unstable. And as a molecule, it has a low activation energy. So, those molecules between the phosphates, so if we draw P to P to P, those three phosphates. These here, these bonds between them, can be broken very, very easily. So what we can do is put this into some kind of equation. So ATP can actually be broken down into something called adenosine diphosphate, ADP. So D means di, T is tri, meaning three. So this is a molecule with two phosphates. So into ADP plus the P, and we have a little I in a bracket to represent the fact that our phosphate is inorganic, and E. Now, E in this example represents energy, usable energy that we have. Now, to do this, to get ATP to become ADP and P, to break, if you like, we need to add water. And we're going to use an enzyme also called ATPase. Now this whole reaction here that I've drawn is called a hydrolysis reaction. I'm not sure if I can get the whole thing in if, if I move this across a little bit. There we go. So this is a hydrolysis reaction. We can break ATP down using ATPase and water to give ADP, adenosine diphosphate and an inorganic phosphate and energy. It's because these bonds between the phosphates are unstable. Now you could actually get the reverse happening. You can have ADP and the inorganic phosphate create ATP if you like and for that we use the enzyme ATP synthase 
And that is what's called, so this reaction here, going backwards, if you like, this here is known as a condensation reaction. So this is a condensation reaction. Or more specifically, because we've added a phosphate to a molecule, it's also called phosphorylation. So let's just have a look at what we've got. We've got adenosine triphosphate. We've said what ATP stands for. We've looked at the molecule itself. So we've shown the molecular structure. We said that the bonds between the phosphates are unstable. And as a result, we can break ATP down to give ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and an inorganic phosphate and energy in a hydrolysis reaction, the reverse being a condensation reaction. So now let's, let's shrink this a little bit move that up just to talk about how we can make ATP because there are actual three ways we can make it so we've said what this molecule is let's talk about how we make it and then I'm going to lead into why it's a good immediate source of energy but then what it's really used for in the body so let's think about how we make it now I'm not going to go into too much detail other than just just name the processes. So the first way that we can make ATP is in a process called photophosphorylation. Now photophosphorylation takes place in palisade cells in the leaf during photosynthesis and it uses photons or packets of light if you like. So we have photophosphorylation in the palisade cells and that's where we can get ATP being generated. We have a process called oxidative phosphorylation and I do have a video that goes into more depth about this particular process. So oxidative phosphorylation occurs in the mitochondria of plants and animal cells during what's called the electron transport in respiration. So during respiration in what's known as the electron transport or electron transport chain, in the mitochondria of plant and animal cells we get a process called oxidative phosphorylation and that's one where we get ATP being made. And the third one I'm just going to mention is called substrate, substrate level phosphorylation. Now, this takes place in animal and plant cells when phosphates from donor molecules make ATP. So there's three ways that I've shown by the addition of phosphate that we can generate ATP. Now let's think about the actual properties of it as a molecule. So what we have here are a list of some things about ATP and Bit of an unusual picture at the bottom there of a mother and baby. I'll explain the mother and baby really shortly. So let's look at some of these properties. ATP, first of all, is a good energy donor. Now that's because it releases energy in one single fast reaction. Now partly because of that, it's also thought of as being an immediate energy source in a cell. Yet because of this, it is not a good long-term energy store. The bonds between those phosphates are too unstable and too readily break. ATP is a better immediate source of energy than glucose directly because each ATP molecule releases far less energy than glucose. Now what that means is because the energy is released in smaller quantities, it's more manageable and it's more useful to drive metabolic reactions in cells. So energy is released in smaller but more manageable quantities. Now unlike the breakdown or hydrolysis of ATP to ADP in a single reaction, the breakdown of glucose involves a long sequence of reactions. 
It's continuously made in the nucleus and mitochondria of cells, and those cells which require large quantities of energy would naturally possess many mitochondria. So we're thinking about muscle cells needing energy for contraction, and even epithelial cells in the small intestine requiring energy for active transport. So let's come back to the mum and the baby. You might be thinking it's a bit of a random thing to put down there. But when I tell my students about what ATP is actually used for, I use this an acronym. MAMAS. Sounds a bit silly. M-A-M-A-S. I think of MAMAS. And that's why I've got the picture of the mother and the baby. M stands for metabolic processes. One of the key reasons why we need ATP. So for example, we're thinking about maybe the synthesis of polysaccharides from monosaccharides, polypeptides from amino acids, or DNA from nucleotides. The A stands for active transport, which I've just referred to. So ATP provides energy to change the shape of carrier proteins in membranes, enabling molecules to be moved against their concentration gradient. So M is movement. ATP provides the energy for muscle contraction. So we've got the M, A and M in place. Let's put in our final A. Now the final A relates to the activation of molecules. So the transfer of phosphate from ATP to another molecule actually makes it more reactive, lowering the activation energy of that molecule. Enzyme-catalyzed reactions occur faster, such as the addition of phosphate to glucose in respiration. So the activation of molecule, molecules is one of the key roles that ATP plays in the body. And finally, the S. And the S stands for secretion. ATP is needed to form the lysosomes needed for the secretion of various cell products. So there we have some ATP properties and a little anacronym of MAMAS to remember the uses of ATP in the body for metabolic processes, for active transport, for movement, activation of molecules and finally for secretion. Okay, hope all that helps.